Hello, everyone. It is great to see you. Um, I think the biggest thing I've noticed about being in person is that we had to put on pants this morning. <laughs> Other than that, it's kind of the same, right? It's great to see you all. Um, I am very, very honored to have been asked to introduce our speaker for today and to get to learn a little bit about him. I am exceptionally excited for this next part, now having done that. Eduardo Haudigui. Okay, Haudigui, I had to learn how to say that. You should know how to say it too. It's like, how to geek, he told me, without the K at the end. But my guess is if you want to learn how to like be more nerdy, he can probably help us with that too. He is a doctorate, doctor of political and social science with a specialty, a doc, his dissertation was on humor and laughter, right up our alley, yes. Um, and he has all sorts of amazing things that you can read about in the program, but just a couple of his highlights. Um, he has taught a positive psychology course at the St. Louis University Madrid campus for a number of years. Yes. He um, has, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? He has his own humor skills company called Humor Positivo, which he founded in 2004. He has successfully been promoting humor at work day across Spain. So that is pretty amazing. <clears throat> and uh, he also has a mindfulness school, Modo Ser. So all things we love, and I'm not going to waste any more of your time introducing him. Please welcome Eduardo Jaurigui. Wow. <laughs> I can hardly believe that I'm here. Uh, about to give a keynote speech at the Applied Improvisation Network Conference. I mean, in front of some of the people that I most admire. You know, I mean, what a crowd. I just, I was just watching you as, uh, as Victoria was leading you in this, this, this play. You know, you are some of the people in the world that most know how to play, and not, it's not just that you know how to play, you're just bursting for the opportunity to play, and you just can't, it's like you, look at you, you just, you just can't wait to get to those workshops, right? And oh, it's just, uh, yeah, I can't, I'm, I, I think somehow we need to, like, recognize this, yeah, let's take a moment to really realize where we are, what kind of, what kind of people we're with, yeah? So I thought maybe you could just for a moment, we could just stand up slowly, just mindfully, you know, just, yeah, getting out of your seats, that's right, yeah, not automatically as we always do, and just let our arm just start to rise up in the air, yeah, that's right, yeah, we're just going to feel the playful energy in the room, yeah, it's like our hands are like antenna, and can you feel like just your fingers starting to tremble and shake just on their own yeah isn't that amazing i mean it's just like trembling and shaking now it's like your hands and your your arms are trembling and shaking and your whole body starts to tremble and shake praise the sweet goddess of improv Woo! big round of applause thank you very much have a seat yeah let's let's not do too much of that because we got all the workshops we got to save our energy Whew. okay so yeah i have to say that was I was a bit, you know, freaking out this week. I mean, it's an amazing gift to be able to be here to talk to you. You know, it's one of these opportunities where you're able to give back a little to people who have given so much to you. I mean, I don't know if you've been in others of these conferences, but wow, you know, what you receive here, and it's not just the people who are in this room, but it's also the people behind you. Yeah, your teachers, your mentors, your colleagues, the people you played with since you were a kid. You know, they're all there. And the people behind them, and the people behind them, and so on and so forth, through history, back through the mists of time. And even like, before humanity, you know, all these animals that also play. Who knows if microbes play? Who knows? <laughs> this is, so this is like a, like a fellowship. You know, that's been carrying that spark of pure creativity through the ages. And here we are, we've got, you put your hands up like this, like we're carrying it right here, yeah? 
and we're bringing it forward. So I thought that speaking with this crowd, it's like I feel I need to say something weighty, <laughs> something you know, not the usual fun and games, which I talk a lot about. You know, I mean, I did my doctorate on, on humor and laughter, but I thought I needed to say something a bit more weighty, a bit more profound. Yeah, but where do I find it, right? Um, anyway, so at one point I thought, well, maybe we need to go yet just beyond just the improv. We need to go to like, didn't really know how to call it, but I thought I'd take you on like a kind of mystical ride, yeah? Are you ready for that? Are you ready yeah. for a mystical ride? Yeah. All right. Are you ready for a mystical ride, Avila? Yeah. All right. Viva la revolución! <laughs> All right. Yeah. In case I... There's somebody here who doesn't know this. Whenever anybody in Spain says, Viva la Revolución, you gotta say Viva like at the top of your voice, yeah? Viva la Revolución! Viva! All right, that's it. Okay, so, uh, let's see, I, got, I do have a PowerPoint. Actually, I'm gonna take a bit of a, oh, no, where's my water gun? Here it is. Uh, you know how it is. <laughs> Especially him. Okay, so, uh, I thought, seeing as Avila, I thought, yeah, we've got to connect with the energy, like Santa Teresa, yeah? Santa Teresa, a great Christian mystic, a uh, very famous Christian mystic, anyway. And so I thought at first, I, I titled this, I titled this, uh, The Mystical Heart of Improv. Whoa, <laughs> yeah. That's what I really wanted to be talking about, okay? This is really the topic of the thing, but the title, there was just something about it that I wasn't convinced by. You know, it was a, bit, a little bit too Sunday school. I went to Sunday school. I'm a race of Catholic. I thought, so maybe this is not so inclusive. Not everybody is like into that whole thing. And even to me, it was giving me a bit the heebie-jeebies. Just looking at this photograph, it was like, whew, I don't know if I want to go down this line. So then I thought, all right, just the heart of it, probably just simplify, you know, make it more, you know, just everybody understands that the heart it was a little bit too cheesy. So I thought, okay, the essence of improv which would have been perfect if this was in France, right? Because les sons de l'improv, you know? It's like in Provence or in a place like that, you're just parfait. But here in Spain, it sounds a little bit too kind of pretentious, so I thought the nitty-gritty of improv, what a great word. Yeah, the nitty-gritty of improv! Woo! Except, I don't know if anybody here knows this, but I, I googled up the origin of this term. According to some scholars, Okay, according to some scholars, not everybody, there's some debate on this, but according to some scholars, this has to do with the history of slavery in the United States, well, in Europe as well, like slaves being brought over and these terribly, just the worst, some of the worst things that human beings have done to other human beings, in these holds, and like when all these people, poor people, you know, leaving these holds, what was left, that was the nitty gritty. No. Oh, just like the most awful, possible, like the most horrible thing you could possibly imagine. And this is exactly, you know, here, we're here, we, 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 the, the theme of this, of this conference is from history to our story. You know, this isn't just any AIM conference, you know, here we're, we're here to talk about inclusion and diversity and, and, and social change and, and breaking down barriers. Viva la revolucion! Yeah. All right! Okay, so I thought, out, out with this, out with this. And yeah, I was left with this. But this is too mystic, this is too like, mysterious, we can't stick with this. So I thought, and in the middle of a deep meditation, I had the insight, I thought, it's got to come out from this group. We're going to come up right here, right now, we're going to come up with the title. And it's not just, and it, we've got to fill in that space, right? So just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to please if you like, you know, this is like, everything I say is just, you know, an invitation. So, but if you like, if you want to join me in trying to figure out what we got to call this, right? Um, I'm going to ask you to just sit, like, on the front of your seat, rather than just, like, lie back on the back. You're just kind of maintaining your own back you know, in one of these positions that kind of expresses nobility. You know, being, like, facing life. Okay, so we're sitting there. You can leave your hands just like lying on your lap, up, uh, facing up, facing down. You can close your eyes if you like, so we're going to go inside ourselves for a few moments. 
And you close your eyes, or you can leave them open if you like, or just looking down, eyes unfocused. And just for a few moments, connecting with your breathing, just observing your in-breath as you breathe in, your out-breath as you breathe out. Or if you don't, you're not into observing your breathing, you just observe sensations in your body. Just connecting with yourself, your physical presence right here. And then I'd like you to accompany me into the inside of your mental space. Yeah, you just go into your mental space and you, it's like you're going to ask your own mind to come up with a sound, a word. But this is like a word that's never been uttered before. Maybe you can just start with a vowel or two and just throw in a few consonants, but, but just whole, not trying to force anything, just allowing it to arise. Just kind of float up in the middle of your mental space. And maybe these letters start to combine, these sounds, and something starts to come up. You can like play around with it a little bit, just allowing it to happen. Nothing forced. Okay? And now you just come back to your body. And you start to open up your eyes, come back to the space. And if somebody, perhaps nothing has come up and that's fine, or nothing that you're very proud of and that's fine too, but if something has come up that you think could be an interesting, <laughs> something interesting to slot into that space, please raise your hand. Okay? We have a few hands going up. Yeah, don't be shy, don't be shy. That's it, you raise your hand. Okay, so I think we have some microphones around. We need to hear this word very, very well. Do we have microphones? Oh, we're improvising again. <laughs> People are rushing around the room. Oh, you forgot about the microphone. Okay, never mind. Let's maybe you can do it without a mic. So, so oh, we do not have a mic. Okay, so please raise your hands again. Those of you who have some ideas that could uh, work, yeah. The Yayo Bosch. The Yayo Bosch of Embro. Okay, thank you. That's a great contribution. We're going to listen to another couple of possibilities. Yayo Bosch. I'm going to write this down because it is a new word. First time it's been ever been written. Yes. The Wala of The Wala. 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 Thank you. Wala. Oh, the accent is on the first U. Wala. Okay, good. We got the we'll ooh, wow. microphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's microphone. Thank down. you. And one more. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Yeah. We got one more here. Gagats. Sorry? Gagats. 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 The gagats of Entra. Okay, so we've got three options now. We've got the Yayo Yayo Bosch. Yayo Bosch of improv. Okay, we've got the Ooala of improv, and we've got the gagats of improv. Okay, now we're going to vote. Okay, it's got to come from the whole group. So those okay. that basically each you're going to think you're going to decide now which is your favorite. I know it's, it's a hard choice, but you're going to each person is going to try to you know really decide. Okay, this is the one that I really want. Okay, so I'll remind you again: Yayo Bosch, Ooala, and gagats. Okay. Right. So those of you who favor Yayo Bosch are not going to chant it with me. Okay. So Yayo Bosch. Yeah. yeah. You, you got it. You got to raise your hand too. Yeah. Yayo Bosch. Yeah. Yayo Bosch. Okay. Okay. We got it. Uh, now we're going to go for Uwala. Those of you who favor Uwala. Okay. Here we go. Uwala, 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 uwala. Okay, great. I think uwala is definitely in the lead here. And now we've got, now we've got gagats. Okay, here we go. Gagats, gagats, gagats. It's definitely uwala. Okay, so now we're all going to chant uwala. Okay, so uwala, uwala, uwala. All right. So the uwala it is. It's the uwala of improv, and that's the title of this talk. All right, we made it. So the Uwala of Improv. So let's see what this Uwala, what the hell this Uwala of Improv is, right? 
Um, so, you know, this is something that you all know very well. But and this is the URL of info, so I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, really. Um, but it's kind of really funny, you know, it's like the, uh, the mystical ride, right? So, um, so I, I've tried to just come up with a real URL. It's like trying to concentrate as much as possible. I've come up with just four words. And I know we're going to split hairs later with the debating all you know, in the next couple of days. Oh, you forgot this. Oh, you didn't say this. Okay, but more or less, you know, we pretty much agree. Okay, so first is listening. You know, you know that powerful listening, active listening, you know, you're listening. And not just any listening, but you're listening now. Now what's going on right now. now. I love this group. It's just thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> listening now. Okay, not just that, but what you just did now, which is Yes, and, right? It usually comes in two, but here, I, I, I'm sorry, in one, but I've split it up into two, right? So, first is the yes, and that's that acceptance. Whatever comes, whatever it is, whatever. Yes, you accept it, you take it in. Doesn't mean you need to like follow it slavishly, but you're taking it into account, right? And then you go for the end, which is you take a decision. What are you going to do? Okay, here comes, here comes this thing, right? And so you're accepting and you're boosh, and you're, you know, throwing it back. So, you know, this is pretty much it. Now, here's a question for you. Is this easy to do? Yes. <sighs> oh, we got somebody who's... We got, a, we got like the real, you know, serious, we'll be talking to you later. Um, so this is incredibly hard. It's like human brains are not designed to do this, right? Except for him. Uh, so, on the whole, right, for most of us, even the people who have been improvising for years, you still, you still got trouble following this, you know? This is hard. This is really hard. Because um, you're trying to listen, you're trying to listen, but you're distracted all the time, all the time, by stuff that's going on, and by those, that mad woman in the house. This is an expression of Santa Teresa for anybody who are not the followers of the Teresa. Uh, the mad woman of the house is always going, she's like independent of you, right? And so this is always going on, and so you're distracted. Now, forget about it, right? It's like you're in the past or in the future. You're thinking, oh, what will we'll have, we'll just have it now, and eh, we we'll have it you know, or you're thinking about what's coming later, tomorrow, or the workshops in a few minutes. Okay, and then forget about, yes, no way, Jose. No way, your mind is just like, you know, whatever comes up is like, no way, Jose. And by the way, I think no way, Jose is definite proof that improv was invented by a Spaniard <laughs> centuries ago. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Jose, that was his name. Nobody knows his last name, but he was Jose. Uh, but of course, he, you know, he tried to do improv. He proposed this, and everybody said, no way, Jose. So pff, nobody paints it. He never got anywhere, didn't get off the ground. And so, you know, Canada, Keith Johnson said. <laughs> So, wait, this is from history to our story, okay? So, Jose. We're we going to be making a statue to Jose later on. And finally, there's Anne, you know? And that's impossible, because you've got your own thing going on. You know? It's like, you know, this thing is coming here, and you're like, oh, but i got my own thing going on right here. You know, look at this. Look at that. i got this thing here, right? So, you, you know, no, i got my thing. Right? So, this is, like, really hard to do. And this is why we train. You train this stuff. You've got to train and train and train and still you just, you can't follow these rules, but you continue training. And that's what we do, right? So many of you are thinking, what the hell does this have to do with Santa Teresa? <laughs> Apart from, you know, the matter in the house. So, it's, I mean, improv is much more fun, right? And much more active and much more, it seems like it's got nothing to do with this. Um, of course, uh, Christian mysticism, you're a great Christian mystic. Uh, is part of something much greater, which we could call contemplative practice. Right? It's like looking inward, different ways of looking within, and developing different aspects of yourself, virtues, and so on. And within this, um, you know, there's also it been, become very popular in the, in the West, not so much the Christian mysticism, but um, you know, Buddhism and yoga and all these things coming from the East. And still these things look nothing like improv, apparently. But of course, what they're doing is going on inside their heads. So how can we really know, really, if it's similar or not? I'm going to tell you that the last time that I was here, I was in this place. Have you seen this building? It's very close to here. You can see it. Where's my water? Gun? I'm going to put it on as far away as possible. 
Um, <laughs> typical. Um, this, as you come down, uh, down the murallas, you come to this place, to the right you can see it's huge building, it's absolutely massive. And it's called La Universidad de la Mística. The official title is like CITES, it's like the Centro de Estudios um, Santa Teresianos y San Juanianos, or so, something like that. But it's, it's known as the University of Mysticism. Amazing place. And it's not just you know, Christian mystics who come. There's the yogis and there's the Buddhists and there's all kinds of people who come. And I, last time I was in Avila, I came here. And I was here for like almost 10 days, I think, uh, doing contemplative practice. And actually what I was doing really was I was learning to teach a course that you might know. It's called Mindfulness-Based Trust Reduction. How many people have done MBSR? Just a, a few, okay. It's very popular, it's become hugely popular. And it's the course that has popularized mindfulness and like now it's everywhere, right? Like everybody is like meditating now. Um, and this was developed by a man called John Kabat-Zinn, uh, who was actually he's a scientist. He was a molecular, started out as a molecular biologist. He was at MIT. He discovered Zen and thought it was wonderful, but he thought most people will never do this. You know, the people I know, the people I love, you know, they just think I'm kooky and they're not going to get into this. So he basically decided to try to come up with the ooh, ooh, voila. The ooh, well out of this, right? And get rid of all the other stuff, you know? Just to get rid of most of the other stuff, right? I mean, he didn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's like, but really the ooh, well, the real like essence of the thing. And uh, so he developed this, this course just to try to, so this wouldn't be about like the Christian ideas or the, you know, the ideas of the Buddha or, you know, and you don't have to dress in any kind of way and you don't, you don't have gongs and stuff like that. It's just, something that has to do with our common humanity. That's all he talked about. He talked about things that everybody understands. Things like pain, pain, and joy, and suffering, and stress, and happiness, and those decisions we have to take every day, you know? And then you're born, and you live, and all this crazy stuff happens, and then you die. You know, that stuff is, you know, that's the real facts of life. It's what he calls it the, the full catastrophe of life right, that we're dealing with every day, you know? And so, um, so, yeah, the stuff that we can all share, our common humanity. By the way, you can have a look. This is a, an online photo exhibition by Angelica Das, which I recommend, which is really nice. And uh, so this has been hugely popular, as you know. There's been a lot of scientific research on this. It's been a like, huge explosion in scientific research, when I studied psychology at university, this was like the kookiest subject in the world. Meditation? Forget about it. I mean, I, I studied a kooky subject, I know. I, I studied humor. People would laugh at me when they heard what I was studying. But this was even kookier. You know, people were you know, like thrown out of university for studying this kind of thing. Um, and so now it's like an explosion. There was like 4% 4, 4 of people were meditating in the States uh, in 2012. Then it was up to 217 to 14.2, which is incredible. It's like triplicated in, in like, you know, just five years. We don't have the latest statistic because this National Health Interview Survey will come out this year. But it's probably going to be much higher because uh, in 2017, there were no meditation apps, no mindfulness apps. Now it's worth $1 billion. So, I mean, this is like a real like, big change that's going on in, in humanity. Probably at a... Yeah, it's probably about time. It's probably, uh, you know, it will serve us well. I'm hoping it's going to serve us well, anyway. And uh, so what is mindfulness, anyway? M many of you know, obviously. It's even been, it's even been the word has been said, even uh, this morning already, before I, I came up here. So um, how many of you people actually, like, practice meditation, have practiced this year, let's say? This year, okay. How many this month? How many this week? How many this morning? All right, a few, nice. Okay, so uh, what is this all about? What are the basic instructions? This is pretty much copied from John Kabat-Zinn, what is his definition of mindfulness. So one is pay attention. He usually says on purpose. So again, it's like active paying attention. You know, you really bring your attention to something. It could be your breath, could be sounds, or it could be your, your thoughts or whatever. In the present moment, the breath is happening now without judging. This is critical. Yeah, whatever it is, you don't evaluate it. It's like, whatever happens, you're not going to judge. You're open to it. You talk about this, like, open-hearted awareness. Yeah? It's like you invite it in. 
like with the hospitality, you know, bring out the welcome mat is another phrase John kabat loves. And there's a final part, but this one is kind of depends. If you're like just sitting in on a, on a yoga cushion, it doesn't often apply, it can apply. It al you also take decisions when you're sitting. But, uh, but mindfulness, of course, is also applied outside of the meditation cushion. So, you know, when you're washing the dishes, you just wash the dishes. You know, when you're walking, you're just walking. When you're eating, you're just eating. When you're conversing with someone, you're having a conversation, you're having a dialogue, you're there. You know, and there you're taking many, many decisions, which flow from all the rest, right? So, you know, this is exactly the same as we saw before. Uh, this, is, um, this is just amazing. I've been meditating for many years, and it's just, this has kind of started coming to me slowly. You know, it, it took a while for this to click. I've been medi improvising and meditating at the same time, but you know, I realized there was a connection, but it's kind of growing on me how close they actually are. Um, and I didn't make this up, of course, I mean, people have, you know, a lot of you are doing this already. You know, I saw on somebody's slide before they were talking about you know, being mindful and so on. Um, so, but I don't know if you know this, the Tree of Contemplative Practices, I love this, somebody came up with this, it's online, you can use this, this uh, in fact, they have a blank one, you can add your own stuff as well. And they've got, you know, the movement ones, like yoga, dance, labyrinth walking, then you've got, you know, meditation, the stillness, and uh, as you can see in the creative, whoops, oh no, what happened there? Oh, I went back, that's it. Um, you've got improvisation right there. Right? So you're doing contemplative practice, even if you didn't meditate this morning. All right, big round of applause. We're all, woo, we're all following Santa Teresa. So um, you could make a case to say that all improv is meditation. I didn't say this. Uh, this was uh, David Rosowski who, uh, who said this. And he talks about improv as Buddhist theater. That's the expression he uses. He says improv is Buddhist theater. Right? You've got getting rid of the self. You know, you're letting, you know, allowing all this stuff to just happen without yourself in the way, always, you know, with a crazy woman in the house, and so on. Um, I don't know if you know Kenny Werner, he's a jazz uh, pianist, improviser, and also a great teacher, great master. And he's written this book called Effortless Mastery. And there's also a movie you can check out. And he, he starts off this, the teaching of, of the piano, he had lots of problems to learn. He hated piano classes. And so he said, you start with one note, you know, and you play that one note until you're really playing the note. So you're really there, you know, really present, and that could take hours. <laughs> this could take weeks just to play that one note. No, but when you really know that you're playing that note, then you can start playing another note with the same kind of being in the moment. You know, that's Kenny one. You can check him out. I also saw this wonderful concept of Zenprof. Uh, Marshall Stern, Nancy Helen Walker came up with this idea, and they, they've done a whole course at Second City. They, they, there's a, a podcast you can listen to with lots of episodes. And then there's all of you, or many of you, anyway, as I was saying. You know, many of you are already doing this, right? So I'd be really happy to talk about this later. I'm sure you have many, many interesting things um, you know, that we can talk about. And, um, and yeah, it would be wonderful to, to know. And I'm sure I'm going I'm to come across this also in the workshops. So um, there's one question that some people might think is, okay, if I'm already improvising, why should I meditate? You know, because basically I'm here just to tell you to meditate. Um, so why should I meditate? I'm already on the tree of contemplative practices. I'm already doing improv, right? So what's the point of view of meditating? Well, you know, maybe, you know, who am I to tell you to meditate, really? I mean, of course. Uh, maybe you're right, and that's your way, and that's all you need. You know, maybe that's fine. But from my experience, I find it really helps to like round, round out your practice. And I'll give you some reasons why. First, is it allows you to train every day, and really any 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 time you want. You know, you don't have to be with your improv buddies. You don't have to come to the AIN, which is wonderful. But you don't. You're not able to do it all the time. And of course, now with you know we're in COVID, we're isolated. How do you how do you have that fun? How do you train this ability, right? How do you do this this playfulness? And so it's a wonderful way of sharpening your listening skills, of strengthening your presence, of opening your heart, you know, becoming more compassionate towards yourself and to the other person who always gives you the wrong you know idea. Um, and going with the flow, you know, push, you know, getting it back, going with the flow. And so you, 
could practice this really whenever you want. And so really, you could play all the time. And when I say play, it's like, it might sound a bit weird, but your life can really become a kind of adventure when you start applying mindfulness. And um, yeah, it's like even washing the dishes, which is something I hate, by the way. As soon as I start, you know, I, I, I'm facing all the mountains of dishes and the dirt and the grime and all that kind of stuff. Ugh, I get this horror about it. It's, it's just, it's a well, particular thing of mine. Um, but if you really then just go into and say, okay, I've got my, not one of the house is saying this is horrible, but then you really go in there and start to listen to the sound of that tinkling water and you start moving around the place. Just this plate, this one plate. It's not washing the dishes, it's just this plate. And you're really there. And suddenly, and you're flowing with it, and it becomes a completely different experience, or it can become, right? So this is a really amazing uh, aspect of this. And, uh, and so it's kind of a way of breaking down the barriers between your improv practice and the rest of your life. Anyway, this is another option. And then, of course, there's befriending stage fright, which, you know, you all have what we all have. I think I, so some people don't. There's some people who really are born without it, I think. But if you do have stage fright, I think it's a wonderful way of, yeah, it's befriending. It's not so much getting rid of it, which is what we want. Like this morning when I was coming here, just before I came in, I really wanted to get rid of my stage fright. But I can, because that's the mad woman in the house. She's there. You know, and she's like, you know, really taking over. You know, like, oh, this thing happening inside. And so it's kind of coming to a different relationship with your stage fright. It's there. It's there. But you can befriend it. It's like a different way. Um, and then you tell me, you know, as I said, and many of you are probably know more about this than me. And some of you maybe will see this talk and maybe we'll start meditating. And 10 years from now, you come up, hey, Ed, uh, Eduardo, how to be? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how to be? Um, hey, that thing, you know, I started meditating and I had this great insight. I really want to share this with you. I'd love to hear from you, you know, in a few years' time. So, uh, some people will. Tell me though, but Eduardo, but Eduardo Howdiggy, uh, <laughs> I'm a lousy, really, really lousy meditator, right? I've tried, I've tried, and I've tried, but my, it's just as soon as I sit down, it's like my brain goes into this spin, crazy spin cycle. And there's all these thoughts going, and emotions, and things, and I can't sit still, and my body's like moving, I can't stop. And, you know, uh, I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain because, uh, in fact, what I, what I want, one, really the biggest message I wanted to tell you today is that I'm also a really lousy meditator. I'm a really lousy meditator. I came, I sat this morning, I did my meditation, my, I was distracted all the time because, of course, I was thinking about this conference I was going to give. I was rehearsing, <laughs> I was rehearsing all these lines I'm saying right now. Um, yeah, in fact, I've written a book. This is my new book that's coming up. My new book is coming out in September here in, in Spain, and it's called Meditar Se Me Da Fatal, which means I'm a really lousy meditator. Okay? I think this is a really important message that I haven't seen on any title in any book, and it's crucial because people get into meditation and they sit down and they see the, the spinning, the crazy spin cycle, and then they leave because they think, I can't do this, isn't for me. Right? And this happens to me, it happens to, you know, I, I'm a, a meditation teacher. <laughs> this is very embarrassing to confess. Now, I mean, I understand why most meditation teachers don't put it up on their websites. You know, they just don't put it, it's like huge, you know, a huge title, I'm a lousy meditator. Um, but it is an important message because you know, the, mind, the mindfulness teachers that I know, the people I was training with here in Avila, they all have the same problems that I have. They sit down and the crazy woman in the house takes over every time, every time, a hundred times during a single meditation. And so, just so you know, meditation is not about being perfectly still and calm and perfect and everything is dandy, no. Um, it's, it's about training, just like when you improvise and you know how hard it is, it's exactly the same. You sit down and your mind goes off someplace and you just go back to your breathing or whatever it is, back once and again and again and again, and that's the training. It's a bit like surfing. Okay, anybody here surf? Yeah? Okay, so surfers know, and people who have watched surfing have also seen it, that surfers spend 95% of the time in the water. They're not on the, you know, the photographs, the Instagram, all that stuff. That's all, you know, when, oh, yeah, on the wave and so on. 95% of the time in the water. Okay, waiting for the wave, getting up on the wave, falling off, and then wiping out, etc. 
Meditation is the same. You sit down, you fall off, fall off, fall off, fall off, and you just get back up. And every time you get back out, get back up, you are strengthening that attention muscle and that compassion muscle and all that stuff. Just like when you improvise. So, uh, I thought we'd do a little, how are we doing for time? Horribly, but uh, let's uh, do a little mystical experience, okay? So for those who meditate this morning, it's just like a little booster, okay? For those who have never meditated, <clears throat> it'll be a, kind of just an interesting experience, a new thing. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to invite you to just, again, sit on the front of your seat, okay? And kind of keeping your whole back, maintaining your own back, okay? With this kind of noble posture, okay? And uh, again, your hands just lying on your lap, facing up or facing down. You can close your eyes and leave them half open or just kind of unfocused. And just for a few moments, just noticing what's going on right now. In terms of bodily sensations, maybe you can feel the temperature, the air on your skin. So different sensations of temperature in the parts of your body that are covered by clothing. You might notice also the sensations of your clothing, the, the touch of your clothing. And you can hear the sound of the aircon in the room. And you can probably also hear the mad woman in the house it's whispering to you or shouting to you. You can hear my voice and other things that are going on. Maybe there's some emotional color, flavor in there. So it's just being aware of it. No need to judge the experience. No need to evaluate what's going on. It's just noticing. That's all it is, just noticing. And I would like you to focus your attention a bit more and bring it to your breathing. Wherever it is that you feel your breathing right now, where you can feel it most clearly. Maybe it's in your belly, maybe it's in your nostrils, whatever it is that you can feel it very, very clearly. And if you don't like watching your breathing for whatever reason, you can, there's another option is you just notice the sensations in your body. You continue with just the bodily sensations. Or you can go somewhere more specific, like sensations in your hands. Now I'm going to call this the anchor of your attention. Okay? So we're going to go back to this anchor again and again, whether it's your breathing or some part of your body. And so you bring all of your attention to those sensations, the physical sensations in that part of your body, whatever they are. If you're observing your breathing, you don't need to control your breathing. You can breathe any which way. No need to evaluate or judge your breathing. It's just trying to observe it with curiosity, as if you've never, never watched your breathing before. And really you haven't, because you haven't watched this moment of inhaling, of exhaling. And of course, there are other phenomena. There's other things going on, you know, like the sound of the aircon, my voice. There's other stuff going on. But the idea is to just try to focus the main, yeah, the main focus of your attention on your anchor. Right? Everything else, you don't need to reject it or throw it out. It's there. You can allow it to be there. But the main focus is on your anchor. Maybe at some point your attention becomes distracted and you notice you're somewhere else. Maybe, you know, the matter woman in the house is saying, but is there more to this? <laughs> or, you know, you, you become distracted by some physical sensation or a sound. And if that happens, that's fine, that's normal. That's just the nature of your mind. It's just the way it works. It's looking for something more interesting. Think about the workshops coming up or, you know, thinking about what I've just been saying five minutes ago. And if you notice that it's gone somewhere else, you just gently bring it back 
to your anchor. In fact, that's why we call it the anchor. And it's nice, I love the metaphor, because it's like, you know, it allows, an anchor allows the boat to you know, go a little bit far away, to move away, but just a little bit, you know, as soon as you notice you come back again and again, you know, it's like tethered there. It's an aid to focusing your attention. And every time you're distracted, you come back. And there's no need to get frustrated. It's a bit like a puppy that runs off after a squirrel. That's its nature. You know, and every time it runs off, it's like, hey, come back here, little one. And you can just pat it on the head and bring it back to your anchor. No need to get angry at the puppy. No point, actually. That's the puppy's nature. Being present and being open to whatever arises in your breathing or that part of your body that you're observing. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to bring your attention back to your body, noticing, remembering where you are. You can breathe a little bit more deeply now, a couple of times. And very mindfully start moving your fingers and your toes, and you can stretch a little bit. Yeah, just a nice stretch. Whatever your body needs at this moment, you can open your eyes, come back, this conference. Okay, so that was just a little mindfulness experience, a little mystical experience. You know, maybe not so mystical, you think, but really that's what Santa Teresa was doing. <laughs> Not one of the house was taken over all the time. Right? You may have noticed. How many people got distracted? Okay, good. You're human beings, right? That's the way it is. So, um, so yeah, that's a um, little experience. And I just to end by reflecting a bit on the term Buddha. Because everybody knows who the Buddha was or has heard the word, has heard the, the name. But uh, very few people know what Buddha actually means. I only discovered this recently, and I was amazed by this. You know, I... I thought I was a cultured person, I thought I knew, you know, just basic things like that, you know, that kind of stuff. Trivial pursuit, what does Buddha mean? Boo. Um, so, of course, it wasn't the guy's name, right? This was Siddhartha Gautama was the historical Buddha, they say, you know, according to the legend. This was a prince who went off, he was, he was obsessed with this idea of like, you know, suffering and illness and death, and he thought, I really want to escape from this suffering. How can I escape from suffering? Right? What a crazy idea. You know, but he was, really wanted to, ah, you know, I want to, find a way. It was sure there had to be a way. So he went off and he studied with various people and they thought he, he was a really good student. He followed all these meditation techniques and he came up and he became really good at them, really adept. Um, but he was, still wasn't able to get rid of his suffering. So eventually he said, okay, do or die. I'm going to sit under a tree and I'm not going to leave until I'm enlightened, until I'm free from suffering. So he sat under this tree, they say, for 49 days. Didn't move, just sat there, meditating, trying to figure it out. And eventually, supposedly, supposedly, you know, he was enlightened at the end of it, right? So, hey, happy end of the story. And he goes off and teaches people and, and, until today. And so, you know, people teaching people and teaching people until me. And, you know, we went to the university and here I am. And so, uh, this, uh, this, um, this man, this man started wandering around teaching people. And one day there was this like sadhu, this like Indian ascetic, who saw him and noticed something special in this guy. And he said, wow, there's something about it. And he just went up to him and asked him, you know, curiously, just, excuse me, sir, but are you a god? That was his first question. Are you a god? The question to ask somebody straight off the bat, just like that. Yeah? Are you a god? And the Buddha answered, nah, nah, I'm not a god. And so then he asked, you know, so are you an angel? Are you a spirit? Are you a demon? He tried various things. And the Buddha said, nah, I'm none of those things. And so he asked, so what are you? And he answered, I am awake. I am awake. And I love that. 
It's so simple. You know, I am awake, and that's all he was claiming to be. Just awake, you know? Not so sleepy as I used to be. I've woken up, right? So, uh, and this is interesting because most people, when they think of meditation, oh yeah, so this is, that's what it means. Buddha means one who is awake. That's it, okay? Meaning of Buddha. Now you know, you can trivial pursuit. Um, so, it's interesting because most people, when they think of meditation, they actually think it's a little bit close to sleeping. We were just doing it now. Maybe some people were dozing out, especially the ones that went out last night. Right? So you're just sitting there. You, you, know, you close all your senses, right? You close your eyes. You're kind of completely still. Uh, you're getting relaxed. It seems, in fact, a lot of people meditate lying down. So it's very similar. It's probably the most similar thing you can imagine to actually preparing for sleep, right? And a lot of people do it to get more relaxed, like mindfulness-based stress reduction. Ooh, I want to reduce my stress, I want to get more relaxed, right? So, ooh, yeah, fine, right? So that's what you're thinking. Um, and so the, this interesting research a few year, years ago, uh, Richard Davidson, around the early 2000s, Richard, uh, Richard Davidson, yeah, in the University of Madison, Wisconsin, he brought these Tibetan, really like accomplished meditators, you know, people who have done like three, minimum three-year meditation retreat, silent retreat, at least one of those. So people have done a lot, a lot of hours of meditation. And he brought them into the lab because he wanted to see what are their brains like. You know, they've been doing all this stuff. He'd been doing a lot of meditation himself. Uh, he didn't tell any of his neuroscientist friends. He was a closet meditator for many, many uh -huh. years. He was. He was. That's, that's exactly how he describes it. He uses those terms. Um, because it was such a taboo subject, it was so kooky to study meditation. So finally he started doing, this was his first piece of research. And he brought this first monk in, this is a French monk, he's called Mathieu Ricard, French monk, uh, but he, he was a scientist, he went to Tibet and, and studied went the Buddhist way. And so um, they asked him to meditate, and the craziest thing happened. The craziest thing that this new scientist could not believe what they were saying. They thought the, the instruments have malfunctioned. But before I can tell you what it is, well, it's suspense. I have to tell you a little bit about brain waves. So there's basically four kind of waves that people talk about usually. Delta waves, which is when you're asleep, they're the slowest waves. Theta waves, when you're a little bit sleepy, you're about to fall asleep, or you've just woken up, right? Then there's alpha waves when you're awake and relaxed, how you usually want to be, right? Just awake, nicely relaxed, you just bet you're awake. And then there's beta waves, which is when you're concentrated. Hopefully some of you are still concentrated at this point of the talk and are experiencing beta waves. Those are the four basic waves. But there's also gamma waves. Gamma waves are the fastest waves. They're really, really fast. But they don't happen very often. They usually appear in those moments of yeah, what a great idea, right? Ooh, voila. Yeah, those moments where you come up with a brilliant idea, moments, those aha moments, that moment of creativity, the, the light bulb popping off, you yeah? know? So it's this kind of like pow moment, you know, boom. And it lasts for a very short time. It's like less than a second usually for most people, right? So over the course of the day, you might have a few of these or none. But you know, it happens every once in a while. And um, so what happened with Mathieu Ricard, this is really what blew these neuroscientists' minds, was as soon as he started meditating, boosh, gamma waves. And it just lasted for the entire meditation, which lasted, I don't know if it was half an hour, an hour, whatever it was, but even, if it lasted even five seconds, they would be impressed. A minute, they would be just flabbergasted. This went on for minutes, 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 minutes. It just went on and on, as long as he meditated. When he finished meditating, boosh, went back down again. They could not believe this. And it wasn't just him. It was all of these experienced Tibetan Buddhists who came in. It's just absolutely crazy. Just from the first article that came out with this guy, with Mathieu Ricard, this was like front page news in newspapers. He was on the cover of magazines. He was, he's been on GQ. This guy, he was, he was dubbed the world's happiest man because there was also another part of his brain that has to do with positive emotions that lit up. And so that was the part that people didn't care about the gamma waves. They just they were interested in the happiness. So they, everybody wants the happiness. So the world's happiest man. And he always says, I'm not. I know other monks who are much happier than I am. He always says he's not. Um, and so, you know, he had, you know, he was gamma waves on all the time. But the really amazing thing was what the scientists discovered a couple of months later. A couple of months later. They looked at the, they looked at the, at the data they uh, 
uh, uncovered. And they discovered that it wasn't just when he was meditating that he had gamma waves. Even before he started, he was already on gamma. It's just there was a boost, more gamma, but he was already on gamma. So these monks, this is crazy, this is crazy, but these monks are on gamma all the time, 100% of the time. And here's the really crazy part, even when they're sleeping. Wow. Yes, they're on gamma when they're sleeping, and it's crazy because the Tibetans, they actually have practices they do while they're sleeping, in their dream. They have to do all this dream work. So now it kind of makes sense. Um, so awakening is not just a metaphor. This is the title of a, of a scientific uh, paper. Um, if most of us, you know, we think we're awake because we're an alpha beta with respect to delta theta, then if you're on gamma, how much more awake are you? We don't know. We don't really know what's going on inside their heads, we just have this data, which doesn't really, you know, we don't really know what's happening, but it's incredible. So, anyway, um, yeah. Um, this is uh, the Dalai Lama. Um, so, and if you think about it, these people who do this, you know, it's, if you look at them, if you listen to them, if you see how they interact with people, they are so awake, and being awake is also being playful. They're like awake and alive, just like I think improvisers are. I think there's a real, you know, the Dalai Lama would not be out of place here. We could bring him into these workshops, it'd be so much fun with the Dalai Lama. Can you imagine how much fun it would be with the Dalai Lama, the ultimate? They have gamma all the time. And all these other people who came, they're all, I've, I've met some of them. Um, I want to see the brief version because we're really never running out of time. You're kind of us telling me, you gotta, I know, I'm going really way overboard. Sorry. Um, just a shortened version because I once met the Dalai Lama and I asked him, I popped him the question. I asked him, how, you know, what is the relation, what do you think is the relationship between humor and playfulness and laughter and spiritual practice? Yeah, the stuff that you do. And, uh, you know, I asked him the question, like the middle of the, it was at the end of this talk, there were people all around, and, um, and he, he, he became very serious and very silent. And he grabbed my hand, and we were just there for like a minute or two, which is in the presence of the Dalai Lama, it's a really long time. And it was like, you know, and he was like massaging my fingers too. It was a little bit like being massaged by Yoda or something. And you really like oh, nice and mushy fingers. And he was like going like this, and so he's just reflecting for a while. And at the end, he says, he says, opens his eyes. So I think that with the uh, spiritual practice, uh, you develop a great inner force. From this great inner force come a great peace. And from this peace, I think quite naturally, come the humor and the laughter. <laughs> and he slapped my face a couple of times and you know, went out with his Tibetan bodyguards. <laughs> and I just sat there. And I have to say, later when I reflected, being a humor theorist, I was a little bit disappointed. I thought he was going to give me something like deeper. But with time, I've come to understand that he really went for the ooh-wala of the thing. You know, that was it. You know, it's like you develop these abilities, these skills, these things you train. You can do them on the, cap, on the, on the cushion, you can do them improvising. You develop these abilities. Yeah? And from there, spontaneously, comes the playfulness. You're not playing all the time, but you're just flexible to whatever comes. You know, and that's just incredible. And now scientists have, you know, figured out that this really is, you know, it's doing something. It's actually, make, it makes a huge difference. So anyway, this is, um, thank you very much. This was the, <laughs> this is my revolution. Viva la revolucion! Thank you very much.